2 Timothy chapter 4. Let me read it out for us. Uh, We're going to start in verse 1. This is Paul. This is the last letter that Paul wrote. These are kind of his, his words on his deathbed, if you will. And he's writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. And here's how he encourages Timothy. Verse 1, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So here's here's really what Paul's getting at. He's about to hand over the reins. He's about to hand off the baton to his son in the faith, Timothy. He knows he's about to die. He's about to be martyred under Emperor Nero for the faith. And so he's giving Timothy, here's kind of my last little bits of advice to you, Tim. Here's how how I want you to carry on after I'm gone. And he charges Timothy in the presence of God and Jesus Christ, all right? If you just got one of the two, it would be it would be sobering enough. But he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge you in the presence of both God the Father and Jesus Christ. Preach the word. Share God's word. Be ready in season and out, out of season. Or in other words, always be ready to share God's word. Even, whether it's a Sunday morning for your service, or if somebody just comes up to you and asks you, Hey, what have you been learning in your time with the Lord lately? Be ready when when you you have it on your calendar and be ready when somebody just asks you impromptu. Be ready all the time to share something from God's word. Be ready for the Holy Spirit to use you in that way. And then he says here as well, there's going to be people in later days who are not going to endure sound doctrine, but they want to have their ears tickled. Or in other words, they want people to tell them what they want to hear. They don't want to hear the word. They want to hear what sounds right. They want, to, they want to hear what sounds good. They want to hear something that makes them feel happy on the inside. They don't necessarily want to hear what God has to say. And he says, listen, don't turn aside to myths. Don't be one of those false teachers, in a sense, that just tells people what they want to hear. Preach the word. Give them this. Because, brothers and sisters, this is Holy Spirit inspired. Okay? Let me give you an example. We've been talking a little bit about the lemonade analogy from Sunday, right? That was, a, that was a pretty pretty massive brain fart on my end. Now, that's a nice analogy, but, but let me remind you, that's not Holy Spirit inspired. That's just an illustration, okay? The, the inspired stuff is in there. When, I, when I'm preaching on a Sunday morning or even sharing here on, on Wednesday nights, the illustrations aren't Holy Spirit inspired necessarily. This is, this is what God promises to speak through. This is living and active, not the lemonade story, Right? This is, this is always going to accomplish the purpose which God sent it out for, not, a, not an illustration about puzzles, which I shared a couple of weeks ago in church. This is living and active. And so Paul says, preach the word. Come back to the word over and over and over again. That's why he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We want to handle God's word well. Now, Friends, the good news is you've studied the passage well, so congratulations. You've done a great job with that. I am remarkably and incredibly proud of you all, and I mean that. Now the question is, does it stop with you or does it go through you to other people as God gives you the opportunity to share what you've learned? And my encouragement to us tonight is this. This last step of Bible study, don't stop short of this. Don't let the truth stop with you. There are people in your life that I'll never meet There are people in your life that everybody else in this room will never meet, and they need to hear what you've learned in James 1. And they're going to need to hear other things that God teaches you in the Word as well, right? And so we're going to talk about how to share God's Word. And for those of you that have taken the spiritual gifts test and found out that teaching is not a strong suit of yours, anybody in that that boat? Yeah, a couple of us are in that boat. If teaching's not your strong suit, don't fret. 
We're going to talk about how to share God's word in normal everyday conversations, not necessarily up in a, in a pulpit or standing in front of a crowd, okay? We can all share God's word even in informal settings in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and we're going to talk about how to do that. So what I'm going to do, just to get us started, same thing we've been doing the last couple of weeks. I want, I want you guys at your tables, share a little bit of what God has been teaching you lately uh, in your time in the word. Uh, things that God's just kind of been showing you as you've been getting into the Bible. Take a couple of minutes to do that. Pray that God will teach us tonight, and then we'll hop in here in just a few minutes, okay? Father, I thank you for your spirit who dwells each one of us who call you Lord and Savior. God, I thank you that we never have to study the Bible alone because if we were left to study your word by ourselves, we would be lost, completely lost and completely clueless. But because we have your spirit, the same spirit who wrote this book, we, we can study in confidence and we can know that you will guide us into all the truth because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He's our helper. He's our, our advocate. He's the one who guides us into all truth. And so tonight, God, as we, as we talk about how to share your word, I pray that you would guide us once more by your spirit. I thank you for the journey that we've been on these last 10 weeks and for the growth that we've seen in, in the people in this room and even those who can't be with us here tonight. God, I am so thankful for how you're causing us to love your word more. The, the word that never fails to accomplish the purpose for which you set it out. God, the word that is perfect, the word that is holy and right and just and true and living and active, the, holy, the word that is that is always profitable and able to equip us to perform every good work. And God, the word is not meant to stop with us, so help us tonight, God, as we think about how to share your word well with others, would you help us? I know for many of us, this is way out of our comfort zone, and so would you help us make this simple, and God, help us do this well, because we want to let the word pass through us to the people who, who need it in our lives. So be with us, God. Would you guide and direct us? Would you Speak to our hearts. Would you equip us to do this well? Because I know it's your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, friends, let's hop into your workbooks under Teach the Word. Now, before we get into some new stuff, last week, I left you all with a homework assignment. Yeah, you thought I would let you off the hook, didn't you? Ah. Would anybody like to take a crack at quoting James 1, 21 through 25. Do you want to give it a shot, Rick? I was just oh, you were just, yeah, just. I'll, I'll try to fucking... Yeah, do the best you can. Okay. Himself. Or hearing not a doer is like someone who looks in their looks at their natural face in a mirror. Good job. And he immediately leaves and forgets what he looks like. Therefore, be deeply into the perfect law that gives us freedom. And be a doer, not forgetting what you have heard. Let's give it up for Rick. That was great. Great job. Man. That was... <laughs> it's okay to sub a word in here and there, right? Does anybody else want to take a, take a stab at it? Everybody's like, nope, Rick did too good of a job. I don't want to follow up that act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> great job, Rick. And, and again, I, I don't know if you got every single word perfectly, but again, let me remind you all, friends, we don't have, it's not about getting every single word just right. Even if Rick missed a word, none of us would know it, right? It, that's, that's exactly it. And so as we're memorizing scripture, the truths that Rick's got in his heart now, Holy Spirit can bring those to mind anytime. And not just for his own good, but also so we can share with others. So here's a couple of realities for you about how to teach the word and why this is Important. So here's one of the, the things I think we struggle with. I think this is one of the, the greatest sins in the church today. There's, there's two great sins I think we have in the church. The first is I think we are very selfish when we pray. 
I, as, 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 I, um, as I have prayed with people and as I have struggled in praying myself sometimes, I, I've noticed that we have a tendency to be very selfish and self-centered in our praying. We pray a lot for ourselves and for our needs, and we struggle sometimes to pray for the needs of others. That's, that's one thing I think we do is even something as, as sacred as prayer can be filled with selfishness, and I see that in my own heart sometimes. The other thing I think sometimes we struggle with, friends, is we can be selfish in our Bible study, and we can make it all about me, and as long as I get what I want out of it, well, then I'm done. And I want to encourage us, friends, listen, prayer becomes much more beautiful and much more rich the more we pray for others. Let me encourage you, be selfless, be a servant in your praying, and be selfless and be a servant in your Bible studies, too. Study the Bible in such a way that you can pass on what you've learned to somebody else. Those are, those are kind of the two big struggles I see in our day and age. So we don't want to be self-centered because the word was never meant to stop with us. The word was never meant to stop with us. I mean, think about it. You have the word today because someone passed it on. The Bible you're holding, that, you, that wasn't the first copy, friends. <laughs> we are deeply indebted to scribes who meticulously copied down handwritten copies of the scriptures. That's how the Bible is so accurate is because we have so many manuscripts. There were scribes who just made it their full-time job to write down and copy portions of scripture. And so we have thousands of copies of most of the books of the Bible. And, and many of the truths that you guys know, many of the truths I know, I didn't just come to them by myself. Most of what I know about the Bible has been shared with me. It's been, it's been taught to me. So we don't want the word to stop with us. It was meant to press through us to other people that we interact with. So here's one of the realities. Again, if teaching is not your thing, most of us, when we think of teaching, what we think of is a pastor in a pulpit or a Sunday school teacher or somebody leading a small group Bible study where they take the word and everybody else has to listen and they're, they're just kind of doing a monologue situation. But I think most teaching actually happens in normal, everyday conversations. In fact, I would say that's how most of my teaching happens. I, I would say that I've probably taught more of the Bible outside of the pulpit than I have inside of the pulpit because I just look for opportunities to share. Now, this is my spiritual gift, Okay. So I'm not expecting everybody's going to do this as often or as passionately as I do, okay? But I do think God wants us all to do this, right? I do think all of us wants us to, uh, I do think God wants all of us to play a part here. And so we're going to talk mostly about how to do this in normal everyday conversations. Now, I know some of you are Sunday school teachers. Some of you are very good at handling the word in front of a crowd. This will help you perhaps a little bit as well, but we're mostly going to focus in on those normal everyday conversations where you're talking with somebody over your lunch break at work, or you're sitting down with a friend for coffee. How do you share the word then? How can you just kind of quickly go through a passage of scripture like James 1, through 25? So at this point, we've studied it pretty well. I think you guys know the passage about as well as we can know it, right? God's, God's taken this truth. He's impressed it in our hearts. He's, he's impressed it in our minds. So Typically what that means is that if you have an opportunity to share it, you're going to take it. And let me explain to you why that is. Generally speaking, the more a passage means to you, the more you're going to talk about it. So if you want to talk to my wife about the Bible, Kara's going to take you to two passages, two books of the Bible. Her favorite book of the Bible by far is the book of Ephesians. And so when Kara is giving people advice or she's praying for people, it's amazing how many times she comes back to the book of Ephesians. And right now she's studying 1 Peter, and it's amazing to me. We'll just be talking in the house, and she'll say, well, yeah, Peter said this, and Peter said that, and Peter said this. And I'm thinking, if I hear one more word about Peter, I'm going to go nuts, okay? But she's just, <laughs> that's what she's studying. In fact, okay, in fact, one of the things she said I was, I was ragging on Peter a little bit because Peter can be pretty thick-headed in the Bible. You guys know that. I mean, he's the one who denied Jesus. He fell when he was walking on water. And, and I was ragging on Peter one day, and she said, don't you say that about my Peter. And I thought, what in the world? Oh, my goodness. You guys are getting close here, right? So, so she cares about these passages, right? And she talks about them because she knows them, and they've changed her life, and, and they mean a lot to her. That's why I talk a lot about Ezra 7.10. That's the verse that's just, it just changed my life. And you all have those passages too, right? If we were to go around the room, all of us have those passages or those verses that have just meant the world to us. And those flow out of us pretty freely, don't they? We don't mind talking about those. And the goal, friends, is to study the Bible in such a way that every passage can become like that. 
Not every passage is going to become your new favorite, but every passage should become a part of us enough that it just kind of flows out of us. And hopefully that's the case with James 1, 21 through 25. Here's a couple of things for you. You can write down, they're not in your notes, but here's two realities that I've learned. Number one, we talk about what we love. We talk about what we love. So this is, this is the grandparent that loves talking about their grandchild, right? You ever met this person at Walmart or Food Lion, and then they pull out their wallet and they show you all the pictures, right? This is, this is that. They, why are they talking about their grandkid? Because they love their grandkid. That's you, Corey, right? This is, this is the car guy who talks about his car all the time. I was out waxing my car again today. Let me tell you how many... How many horses are under the hood? Like, they they talk about what they love. And generally speaking, friends, we talk about the things that we love most. And so if you were to look back, just think for a minute, if you were to look back over this past week, what did you talk about the most? What did you talk about the most? That will probably give you some indication of what you love most. Now, there's ebbs and flows, obviously, from week to week. But here's my question. How much did you talk about God and his word? And I have to look at my own heart there, friends, and sometimes I can, go, I can go a whole week and the Bible's barely on my lips. I can go a whole week and I, I feel like I talk about things that are just so trivial. I get so caught up in politics or sports. I get so caught up in just the affairs of this life. And those affairs do matter. I'm not saying we shouldn't care about them, but how if, if what I talk about most reveals what I love, then... We'll talk about the word more when we fall more in love with the word. And maybe we don't talk about the word a lot because we don't love it the way we ought to. And maybe I don't because I don't love it the way I ought to. So we talk about what we love. Number two, the second thing you can write down is we talk about what we know. We talk about what we know. So have you ever been in a conversation where there's an inside joke going on and you have no idea what's happening? It's kind of maddening, isn't it? Or have you been in a conversation maybe with a a couple of coworkers or a couple of people who work together that you don't work with, and they start talking about their job, and you're just completely out of the loop, right? And you're just thinking, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about. I can't contribute to the conversation. When you don't know what people are talking about, how much do you contribute? You keep your mouth shut, don't you? Because you don't know what to say. You don't know where to, you don't know where to hop in. You don't have much to contribute. And friends, I think this is maybe another reason why we hold back from sharing the word is because We feel like we don't know it well enough. And we want to say something, but we don't want to misquote a verse. We don't want to teach it wrong. We don't want to share it the wrong way or maybe lead somebody astray. And so this is why studying the way we've been studying is so important, because now you know it, and hopefully you love it. And so both of those two things, listen, we pray, God, help me love your word. Love this passage. God, take what we've learned. Get it in here. Get it through my thick skull so that when I am in a position to help somebody, I know it enough that I'm not scared to talk about it. I'm not scared to bring this up because I, I, I'm in the conversation. I, I have something to contribute, not of my own, but of your word. That's, that's the way we want to look at this. Now, here's how we do this. This is, well, I'll tell you how I do this. So generally speaking, here's, here's what I do. When I'm done studying the word, I think through and talk out how I would share what I just learned with another individual. So I do this every Friday and Saturday night. I study the word. I'm preparing for Sunday. I will have a cup of coffee in my hand, and I will pace back and forth like a maniac in my kitchen and my office at the house, and I'll just pace back and forth, and I will be just verbally talking out loud, just verbally processing. God, why does this work like this? How should I explain that? Should I use a lemonade story? What illustration should come to mind? God, how would I explain this to somebody else if they didn't know what I now know? And that's how I just kind of talk it out. Now, some of you, you like to talk it out like me. Others of you, you like to just sit and think for a few days and just let it marinate for a while, right? Just just stew on it for a little bit and let it sink in a little bit more. However works best for you, the idea is we want to think through the best way to communicate it. So like I said, I I pace around the room and I'm typically asking myself questions as I go. So here's a few of the questions that I typically come back to. The first question I ask myself always is, 
What was I convicted of as I studied? What was I convicted of? So if I look at our passage, brothers and sisters, I am immediately convicted of two things, like even, even today. The first of which is my tendency to be a hearer. I am way too satisfied with understanding the Bible and not living it. And that hits me over and over and over again. Every time I think about this, and I think about the gap between how much of the Bible I know and how much of the Bible I live, that is a humbling thing for me. And I just say, God, please help me. Please forgive me. Because sometimes what happens, and I'll just, I'll just shoot really straight and honest with you, sometimes what happens is I get into a passage and I study it, and I don't want to pay the price of being a doer. Because being a doer does carry a price tag, doesn't it? Sometimes we don't go into a passage really intending to be a hearer. But once we get into it, we would rather just forget, like the forgetful hearer, than do what Jesus is asking us to do. Sometimes we look at it and say, Lord, that's, that's a lot you're asking of me. It's hard for me to lay down that sin. It's hard for me to trust you in that area. So even though I came into this passage with every intention of being a doer, now that I know what it looks like, I would rather be a hearer. And sometimes, sometimes we choose to settle. And that's convicting of me. So, so when I share this passage, friends, if that's where I've been convicted, my assumption is somebody else is probably going to be convicted in the same exact area. So that's one of the ways I want to hit on it, okay? The other area where I'm typically convicted is in the last part of the, the passage. Whoever abides in the perfect law of liberty. Sometimes I struggle to abide because my head goes a million different directions and I'm busy right now, so I want to sit down in the Word, and I want to soak it all up in five minutes, and the Bible doesn't work like that. You can't soak this up in five minutes. It takes abiding. It takes time. We're actually going to talk about that on Sunday. And sometimes I want to have the spiritual maturity of somebody who's abiding without putting in the time. And that's convicting for me. And I, and I want to be the person who, who is willing to say no to other things so that I can abide. Does that make sense? And if those are the two areas I'm convicted, when I, when I teach this passage, or if I ever preach this passage on Sunday, you better believe I'm probably going to hit on those two things. What you're convicted of, somebody else is probably going to be convicted of too. So that's the first question. Next one, which word pictures struck me the most powerfully? So this is where those word pictures are going to be helpful again. And the word pictures that hit me the most are probably different than the ones that hit you the most. And that's, that's great. That's okay. That's why we teach the Bible differently from one another. And that's okay. See, the ones that strike me the most powerfully are the idea of putting aside, like laying something down without ever wanting to go back and pick it up again. One of the words in the, in the passage, the word filthiness in verse 21, it's a medical term that, that pictures an excess buildup of earwax in your ears. Okay? Now, if you've got too much earwax in your ears, what can't you do very well? You can't hear. So it's almost like James is saying, if you want to hear the word, you got to clean out your ears first. So I typically use that picture. Okay, well, I, I use the analogy of the man in the mirror and the two different types of looking in our passage. I hit on some of those word pictures because they've meant a lot to me. You might have different word pictures, and you might explain them differently than I do. But when we use these word pictures, it kind of makes it come alive a little bit more, right? Some of you might really like the picture of the implanted word. Maybe you're more of a gardener. You've got a green thumb. Go with that. Talk about that as you share this passage. Whatever, wherever God has impacted you with this passage, feel free to use some of those word pictures. Here's a couple more. Did any analogies come to mind through this passage? This is where I came up with the lemonade story for last week. What does this passage remind me of? Oh, it reminds me of that time I made lemonade without any water right? And for you, maybe you're going to think of a different analogy than what I do. This is what Rick does almost every week with the kids, right? He comes in with an analogy that ties to a verse. He starts with the verse, and he's like, okay, what analogy comes to mind here? How can I, how can I illustrate this? Sometimes it's good for us to think that through. How can I illustrate this? Does this passage remind me of another passage? Are there any other Bible verses that sound like this one? So let's go back to the implanted thing for a minute. Receive the word implanted. Well, that reminds me of the parable of the sower and the seed. You got the seed. What kind of soil does it fall into? It's being implanted, but what kind of soil is your heart? Is it rocky ground? Is it thorny ground? 
Are the cares of this world and persecution, are they choking that seed in you? Or is it good soil that the word's falling into? What, what kind of soil is your heart? What kind of environment is the seed of God's word growing in in your heart? Right? One of the other things I think of a lot is Matthew chapter 7, at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them can be compared to the wise man who built his house on a rock. Why? Because he not only heard, he did. He was a doer. Anyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them may be compared to a foolish man who built his house on a piece of sand. And the winds blew and the rains came, rain came coming down and that house fell and great was its fall. What was the difference? One was just a hearer, their house fell. They were building on the wrong foundation. The other person was a hearer and a doer, just like our passage talks about. So what other passages come to mind for you in the passage that we're studying here? Maybe you're thinking of different passages than what come to mind for me. What does, how does this passage point us to Jesus? So every passage of the Bible points us to Jesus, okay? That's a, that's a fundamental thing you can always take to the bank in the Bible. Every passage points you to Jesus. Some passages, in fact, most passages, talk specifically about Jesus. It's not hard to make a beeline to Jesus. Other passages, maybe you have to study it a little bit more and, and draw the connections that God's wanting you to connect. So how does this passage point us to Jesus? What do you guys think? Somebody help me out. How can you take our passage? What does our passage have to teach us about Jesus? How does it point us to Christ? He's the word. Yep, absolutely. Keep on going. He's the word that saves us. Okay, keep going. What's that? We live in freedom. Freedom that he purchased for us, right? Give me more. He blesses us. Okay, so it's not just this random blessing from nowhere. There's a specific person blessing us, right? Give me one more. How does this teach us about Jesus? Ah, who's the perfect doer? Jesus. So all of us have struggled with this, right? And let's, I mean, let's get, let's get really raw and honest here for a second. I've had, I've had many seasons in my life, friends, where I have tried hard to be a doer of the word. And I have fallen flat on my face. And there were seasons in my life where I started to wonder, is this even possible? Is, is it even really possible to be a doer of the word? Because I'm struggling with this. I, I keep face planning spiritually. I keep messing up. I try harder in this area, but then I fall in a different one. And then I try harder in that area, and then I, and I fall in a different one. And I can never quite seem to get it just right. And, and friends, listen, there's, there's a point in our lives where we start to think, well, maybe this just isn't for me. Maybe this is just something Jesus could do. Maybe this was just for the 12 disciples and the Apostle Paul. Maybe this isn't a life I can actually lead. And then what we're, we're tempted to do is just settle. Just settle for a mediocre, casual, Christian life that's no threat to Satan whatsoever. And that's what the enemy wants you to think. But then when we look at this passage and we look at Jesus and we think to ourselves, wait a minute, it's no longer I who live, but who lives in me? It's Jesus. The perfect doer lives in me through his Holy Spirit. We saw a couple of weeks ago, now may God himself sanctify you completely or entirely, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. God wants you to be a doer. That's not a life that's out of reach for us. Being a doer is not for super Christians and pastors and people that are famous. Being a doer is for all of us. But we have to look to Jesus because he's the perfect doer. He's our example. We can't just gut it out with willpower and self-control. That's going to lead you to despair because you'll fall every time. But if we look to Jesus, what did Jesus do to be a doer? Well, we talked about it on Sunday. Every word that came out of his mouth was directed by who? Holy Spirit. And then he says this, I, the, the works I've done, I've never done of my own initiative. I've only seen what I saw the Father doing. Well, he did what he saw the Father doing. He, he followed the Holy Spirit's lead in that. In other words, listen, Jesus never once lived a moment of his life in his own strength and power and wisdom. He always, every moment, leaned on God. So how do we be doers? 
we do what Jesus did. This passage points us to Jesus. How do we be a doer? We, we follow the perfect example. And so when we think about this passage, if I'm sharing this, and I'm talking with somebody just in a normal everyday conversation, I'm willing to share with them, look, I've screwed up my life over and over and over again, and I've thought this wasn't possible. And so if you're here and you're, and you're a follower of Jesus and you feel defeated or have felt defeated in the past, welcome to the club. That's all of us. But there's hope that you can live in victory. You just have to look to Jesus. So I'm making a beeline right to Jesus Christ when I share this. Right? That's, that's how we think through what to share in this passage. Now, here's another question for you. What did I learn from this passage that wasn't immediately clear to me? Because the things that didn't make sense to me at first might be confusing for other people too, right? And so when I'm thinking through a sermon or I'm thinking through how to teach a passage, this is great for those of you that teach Sunday school, by the way. If you're confused as you study a passage, hit on that thing hey, when I studied this, the thing that didn't make sense to me was this, so let's talk about it. And that's a great place to go because you can assume probably 75% of the people in the room are also confused by that, okay? And so it's a good idea. One of the, one of the things I ne- did not understand about this passage, I, I just could not figure out the word man. I thought it, ref- like, why, why it doesn't James use the word for mankind or humanity? Why is he picking on us, fellas? It's because men and women look in the mirror differently, right? We don't want to look in the mirror of God's word like a man looks in the mirror. We want to take our time in front of the mirror like stereotypically a lady would, right? We want to abide in the mirror. We want to spend time there and take care to fix the things we see that are wrong with our lives because the mirror always shows us the state of our hearts. So when I explain this passage, you better believe I'm hitting on the man in the mirror too because that's typically confusing for people. And so I want to explain to them, okay, here's, here, here's some things that I didn't necessarily understand. Now, here's the, the last couple of things here for you. Teaching is simply the art of being able to explain something, okay? So we're not talking about giving a sermon, like I said. We're not talking about putting together a, a bunch of quotes and illustrations and, you know, making this all, you know, prim and proper. But can you just, in your own way and in your own words, walk somebody through a passage like this? What are the word pictures that mean the most to you? What are the things that maybe have have touched your life the most about our passage? So that's that's a little bit about teaching. Now, here's here's how I'm looking at this as well from a personal standpoint. One of the cool realities is that the more I think through how to teach a passage, the more I learn. How many of you have done Sunday school and you found that to be true? You study a passage and you're like, wow, I learned a whole lot more than I bargained for just because I was trying to teach it to other people, right? Right? As you do this, you actually get more out of the passage you're studying. And so if you shortcut on this, you're actually forfeiting your own personal growth a little bit as well, right? And so the part of, your, your, part of the point of your study time is to prepare you to share God's word well. That's what we want to do. Your study time is to prepare to share God's word well because the word was never meant to stop with you. So let me give you one last encouragement before I give you some homework here. One last encouragement is this. I think the way we take notes in Sunday school and church or Bible study will change when we think about this reality. So if I'm I'm sitting in the conference like I did with with Rick and Corey this past weekend um, at at the East Coast Men's Conference, when I'm taking notes, I'm not just taking notes so I can remember. I'm taking notes so that I can remember enough to pass it along. And if you do that, you take notes differently. You have to take down more, and you have to, you have to remind yourself, okay, I want to I remember this, because if I want to communicate this to somebody else, I, I want to remember this particular point. And so my encouragement to you, friends, is take notes in such a way that on Wednesday you could share what you learned on Sunday, and on Sunday you could share what you learned on Wednesday. Take notes in such a way that you can pass on what you've learned to somebody else. And if you do that, you'll take notes a little bit differently. Now, here's how I want us to wrap up. How I want us to wrap up is at your tables for the next 15 minutes or so, I want you to talk through some of these questions for yourselves. Talk through, okay, how, how would I share this? How would you share this? What were the keywords that hit you the most? What were the, what were the realities that maybe weren't clear to us? What were some of the things that maybe uh, jogged our memory of other passages? Where did we think about Jesus when we studied this? And I want you at your table to come up with 
here's how I would share this passage. Here's how I would communicate this to someone else. Now, we're not talking a long time. How would you share this passage in three to five minutes? How would you share this passage in 10 minutes? Because that's where normal everyday conversations, that's about the typical length, okay? I know a lot of them go longer, but you don't have to prepare a big sermon here. Just how would you simply, clearly walk somebody through this passage in a way that makes sense to them and to you? So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes at your tables, talk it through together, help each other out. How would we share this passage?